little bit of a different twist to medical marijuana and, and the legalities behind it, but the knowledge behind it. So I believe most of you that are in HR roles probably have already seen an HR presentation. I'm sure, Cheryl, you have, and, and to a few of you. I know I've seen a few, and, and they're very... Um, I shouldn't say that, because Pat went to one that was a little bit more on the knowledge and wellness conversation, not on the legalities. Am I correct, Pat? Yeah, so, so, it's, so we're getting a lot of variances in terms of this conversation. Uh, what I want to do is kind of mix the two together today. So we're here to create a little bit of knowledge and awareness um, and some of the applications or the concerns that we have as it relates to benefits. We also need to introduce to some level the, the legalities behind it because you're going to have to make sure you do some things right because it's not like this is a new thing because you already have policies and procedures in place and you do know that you have to deal with things that you're already dealing with today with, with regards to abuse of any level, right? So, so this is just an, I would call an add-on conversation. Um, I do want to introduce briefly though, because Colton did roll in. I see Colton at the back. He's wearing the, I call him the Easter egg. He's wearing the nice, it's a nice shirt though, actually. It's a really nice shirt. So, <laughs> actually I did. I did, see, Colton, I'll take full, I'll take full uh, blame for that one, but, um, okay, so, and he's our business development guy too, so he's been with the company a year and a half, very knowledgeable, what I'm liking is that we can pick his brain as it relates to the millennial world, I'm not seeing this whole world's changing because of millennials, because there's a lot of shifting still going on as it relates to the 40s and 50s and 60s, we have to deal with that world too, but in the year 2025, they expect or they say that 50% of the working population will be millennials. So we, that's why this technology conversation becomes critical. That's why this cost management and the way we think benefits becomes critical because it's shifting very, very quickly. So that's why we're going to talk about medical marijuana. So what was interesting, um, Mike Francis uh, from Best Buds Society is coming to join with us. He's going to formally introduce Wendy uh, Fox. And we have another guest, Pat, in the crowd. But um, what I actually quite liked about Mike is that um, he starts out by saying uh, he's quite, he's a pretty smart dude. Um, I'm saying that for you. I'm just like just gathering, gathering facts here. He understands the value of practical communication. I love that line. That, like, that's a really good line because that's really what we need to do every day in our jobs or your roles is practical communication. So take the myth out of maybe the marijuana conversation um, and you've got the skills and the ability to educate people in the public and the private sector because of some of his um, his past, I guess, roles or careers. So he's been uh, in both areas. He um, has a deep relationship with cannabis because it runs in family history. He does utilize it medically for his son. He'll talk to you about that. So that was really important for us to know why he's become quite intimate with it. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting. If I can move to my second page. Sorry. I, I, ha I, had to, I had to mention this. I thought it was really cool because he is very, very intelligent fella. He's got a certificate in French, which is kind of neat. Um, but he, picture this, he was a professional bagpipe player and instructor. <laughs> I just think that's really cool. And he was an assistant band director for the Regina RCMP, which I thought was really cool. So um, he's got uh, obviously a, a broad um, array of connections and conversations and relationships, and I think that's going to be helpful in your business for sure. So with that, I'm going to do, introduce Mike. Um, I'm going to wait. Actually, Randy just slipped out, so I'll formally introduce him when he does roll back. But you roll. cannabis anywhere right but that's not what it's all about you can't just buy cannabis and expect to heal if you don't know how to use it and that's where we come in how you doing welcome to best buds what brings you in today i feel best buds is a relationship driven business we really try to get to the bottom of the patient's needs and try to get the best product for them there's a lot of doctors that prescribe cannabis to people that have never used cannabis before and they come into our shop and they're uh they're actually surprised at, uh, at what we have to offer. That's my motivation, is, is to help patients.
Our products range from flour to concentrates to edibles and it's very important that patients have many different ways to consume cannabis. I think that's actually helping with the muscles, the muscle problems and the spasms because they're so weak now. Have you tried any cannabis cream on it yet? Uh, yeah, I've tried the Cuthbert's cream. How'd that go? It's magic. It's way better than any other cream. No negative effects from it at all? No, none at all. It's a safe place for people to come and get information. People definitely walk out of there in a better state, more prepared to deal with their health issues than when they came in. Almost daily, we have someone coming in there explaining, you know, how their life has changed with using cannabis, getting off of pharmaceuticals. It, it's, it's daily. It's actually overwhelming sometimes. <laughs>
And I don't expect that you'll know them in particular, but you might remember in the, in the news and the media, because they really weren't that long ago, so it was around the year 2000, this landmark uh, Parker case where the Ontario Court of Appeal, it was the first case that invalidated Canada's uh, cannabis prohibition. Uh, the order was to invalidate, was suspended for a year though, so that the federal government could figure out what they were gonna do. And in 2001, they decided, with the medical marijuana access regulations, which uh, was introduced by them. And this allowed for uh, limited uh, medical cannabis use. And there was basically two broad categories. Doctors could prescribe uh, cannabis for people uh, that uh, were in, uh, to ease the pain and, and end a life situation. And then there was another, uh, an, uh, uh, other uh, forms, for example, uh, pain from arthritis, uh, uh, you know, pain from, from cancer, uh, bone therapy, and so on and so forth. In 2013, um, and then, so after 2001, and between 2001 and 2013, there was a whole number of, of challenges, a lot to do with reasonable access to cannabis. So they said, you can have cannabis for medical reasons, but we're not really sure how you're going to get it or who's going to get it to you, which forces patients to go get their cannabis from the only place that anybody knew where to get it from, which was the black market. So cannabis patients fought, challenged the government. The, originally, there was one producer of cannabis, and they were based out of uh, uh, Saskatoon Prairie Plant Systems, which now becomes Canamed, um, that, that, that produced uh, dry milled cannabis that was not very popular among medical patients. So they fought back, they challenged in the courts, they started grassroots dispensaries, which we'll get into in a, in a moment. And because of all of this, by the time 2013 rolls around, the government says we've got to come up with a new set of regulation. And they came up with the uh, Marijuana for Medical Purposes regulations, the MMPR, and that released, replaced the MMAR. And this creates the, and regulates the system that we have today, which was uh, a system that provides for uh, a licensed producer system um, and no provisions for the extant um, medical marijuana dispensaries that were already providing patients with their medicine. And uh, that's, uh, that's a bit of a struggle. And uh, we were asked to come speak here today. I come from the side of things from the medical uh, marijuana dispensary position. Um, I'm familiar with the uh, uh, licensed producer position and we can definitely talk about it. But even in my own personal experience, when I became a medical uh, cannabis patient, um, it took me three months from the time that I got my prescription from the doctor to the time that I got my medicine. So three months. And, and, and just imagine any medicine where it takes you three months to get your medicine. It's just not, doesn't make a lot of sense. A, a really good friend of mine is a dentist and he said, you know, Mike, I can prescribe you an opiate right now that would knock you on your feet, or knock you off your feet. Uh, and you don't need a special license to, ha to carry that but you do for this cannabis. It just doesn't make, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So, so, so anyways, what does medical cannabis look like today in Canada? So this, this chart here is from the end of 2016 and there's some really, really interesting data on here. You can see that in, by the end of September, uh, I think around S September 2013, um, between September and December, there was a 34% increase. Almost 130,000 Canadians by the end of 2016 had a prescription for medical cannabis. Um, there was just an article out last week. Uh, uh, it, uh, the airports in Canada now are no longer going to call the police every time somebody has medical cannabis in the airport. So prior to just before a few weeks ago, if you were at Pearson and you had a prescription for cannabis and you had cannabis on you, they had to call the police and the Peel police had to come and check it. Um, there was, uh, the statistic was something after 3,000 of those checks between January and, and October of this year, they just said enough. There's too many people that are traveling. So anybody that has less than 150 grams and has their prescription with them, the police are no longer gonna be called. But I mean, this is just, it's, it's, it's almost staggering the sort of growth that's happening. Now, obviously there are a lot of people that were using cannabis as a medicine without a prescription. And because of the changes in the attitudes in society, people are feeling, feeling emboldened to speak to their doctors and to be honest and come out with this. And that's what's driving some of these 
these numbers because obviously there were people that were using cannabis. Now, it was mentioned that I come, I, I sort of come from a unique situation where I was a person that, uh, I was sort of born a square <laughs> and I wasn't around any of them. And, uh, and uh, maybe uh, finding the bagpipes and stuff was a resilience mechanism to sort of get away from what I perceived was a, a negative part of my life. But I was around cannabis a lot and in the, say in the 1980s, when you had a cannabis, a person that was growing cannabis what, what back then would have been considered a real hardcore criminal. There wasn't really a, a difference between people that were medical and people that were uh, recreational. Back then, recreational and medical was sort of all together. And then if there was somebody that was actually quite sick that needed cannabis, the recreational people would like kind of work together. I had an uncle who was a grower in a small town in Saskatchewan, and uh, there was a person there that was that was very very sick, and uh, they um, you know they got they got it a lot cheaper than the recreational people. But those people used to all work together. And part of what we're doing today is trying to get people to say, okay, you know, even though I'm just a recreational user, um, maybe I should talk about it so that people don't think that this is something that uh, is, uh, is, is so bad. Uh, I, I have a couple of slides here I just wanted to show this is a few years old from 2013, and it's just showing cannabis use in Canada. This is just general recreational use. Um, and in Saskatchewan, for example, you have 8.8% .8 of the population that within the last year would have tried using cannabis. Now, this is a, a statistic from around the same time, and this is a population percent with the permit to possess medical uh, cannabis. Um, I even have to catch myself. Um, but you can see in, in Saskatchewan, less than 1% of the population at that time had it. So that means 10% had tried, less than 1% had, and obviously that number is changing. So where can I get my medical cannabis? As I mentioned before, before 2014, Saskatoon-based prairie plant systems, now known as CaniMed, was your only choice. And it wasn't a choice that was so popular with uh, people. After 2013, the government, and when they changed their regulations, they sort of opened the floodgates and they created a licensed producer system. So now there's more than 40 companies in Canada that grow licensed medical cannabis. And if you become a patient for medical cannabis, how it works right now, according to the latest legislation, is you have to go and get your prescription mailed to one of these places and then they send you it back in the mail. And it can take up to three months. Okay, so that's where we come in. Although there's an estimated 500 to 1,000 medical dispen uh, cannabis dispensaries in Canada, they are mostly not regulated and operating outside of the law. So why are there so many dispensaries if they're operating outside of the law? These dispensaries grew out of grassroots organizations. So, so my partner Pat here, who's been involved with medical cannabis just about since you could be, had been working for a long time in developing what we are today. So as a, as a storefront a cannabis dispensary, you know, two to three years we've been in operation, probably been going back 15 years for that. So, so we were in operating before the last legislation. I don't want to say that that means we were grandfathered into anything, but um, um, why, why are we there? Since 2013, legal cannabis can only be obtained by mail with only dry flour and tincture oil being made available. So there, in that video that you just saw, there's a number of products. I'll, I'll use one, for example, that you're probably not familiar with. Um, cannabis oil suppositories. What? What are these things? I, I found out about them from a lady I know who works with veterans. Veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder are finding a lot of comfort in using these cannabis suppositories. Well, why? Well, one of the reasons why is uh, the way it's administered in the body, there's no psychoactive effects, so they're not feeling medicated or quote-unquote stoned. So they, they, a, a lot of ex-military people, they're not looking for that. And it's entering their body and it's really helping with their symptoms. Now, according to the current legislation today, that is an illegal method of taking medical cannabis. So, so, so we don't feel that that is, is such a bad thing and, and these people are looking for a quality alternative to try to find their uh, medicines from. So outside of this, like this sort of this growing cabal of LPs, and I mean, and some of them are doing good work, I'm not here to disparage them, but it does seem to patients 
that maybe there's something else going on. Even the, the owner of Tilray, which is a popular licensed producer from uh, Vancouver Island, uh, 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 was quoted in an article, uh, article saying that um, certain LPs seem to be give, gaining an advantage by giving uh, uh, doctors kickbacks for prescriptions. I mean, in the first presentation, I know that this isn't something uh, in my old industry in consumer packaged goods, uh, we didn't do things exactly like that, but there was always, you tried to work to get the business. In September 2017 article, uh, this is relatively recent, um, uh, uh, a journalist discusses the hypocrisy. Uh, the former Toronto police chief, Julianne Fantino, uh, who once compared the decriminalization of cannabis to the legalization of murder, is now running a company that marries patients to the proper licensed producer. So, 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 so from the cannabis, medical cannabis community, there seems to be like maybe this system is being set up for, for some other reasons. But, but, I, but th these, are, these, are, these are just, these are just uh, things that we read. Most people feel that they have a right to see, smell, and touch before purchasing items for consumption. So, so when right now, if you want to get medical cannabis, you've got to go on the internet, look at a picture, click on it, order it, and come. That is not how human beings generally like to get things that they consume. Think of cannabis more like produce. So you go into the store and you get your produce, you're looking at it, you're checking it out, maybe you want to smell it, and, and that is the sort of thing that patients expect. And this is why um, we have a dispensary system. And, and, they, and, 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 a, and a dispensary system, I have to admit, that, that works very well. And I don't know if any of you uh, caught the news last week, but the CTV did a, a sort of a, a week-long series about, about cannabis and all the things on. And they were talking to us in the dispensary. And just the kind of feedback that we're getting from people that are seeing this and coming in and the awareness, it's, it's, really, it's really quite something. Anyways, um, I know we have uh, a lot to get through here, but before we get through uh, much more, I'm going to invite up my friend uh, Wendy, and I, I think Wendy is a, is a great person to come and, and chat with you folks. I'm just going to say a, a little thing about her. Uh, Wendy is a retired healthcare professional. She was uh, a nurse for a long time and uh, was not a regular user of uh, cannabis uh, whatsoever. So I think uh, she's got an interesting perspective, and I've asked Wendy to come up and uh, talk a little bit about today about the different ways that people are uh, coming and talking to us about using medical cannabis. So here you go, Wendy. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. I have one of these voices that apparently put people to sleep. I've, I've done it many, many times, so I'll try to not do that with you today. Uh, I am one of you. I don't do drugs. I worked in healthcare. I was a nurse for 33 years. My last job, I looked after almost 1,900 employees. That was my job. Watching them navigate, watching them uh, lose loved ones. Um, many, many things. But I was one of you until January. Um, the thing that's really important about this is, is sometimes we end up in situations where we, we're at a dead end. And when we're at the dead end, we're looking for alternatives. So my, my mom is 84 years old, and she kind of became my looking at her quality of life. And, and the issue here was more watching this woman go through pain. Now, I did find out she was using dilaudid or morphine to go to church or to go play cards with her friends. And I was going, Mom, you shouldn't be driving. Like, dilaudid's crazy. Um, anyway, I, I got a hold of this pain stick. And on it went. I put it around her knee. And she said, Oh my goodness. I said, no, 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 no. She says, she says you're going to make me crazy in the head? I go, no, no, mom. I, like, I'm not going to do that to you. Like, you're my mom. And she says, but I am going to do an experiment with you. So she's sitting down and she's, okay, two and a half minutes and I'm timing. And she says, she starts going like this with her knee. And you guys can't see me at the back. <laughs> but basically she starts to extend her knee. And I said, does it hurt? Is it burning? Are you okay? And she goes, no, 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 no. She said, it doesn't hurt. And I said, ah, the real proof is that you have not stood up yet. Let me see. So she stands up and she goes, 
takes three steps and she, I'm not gonna do enough here because I'll probably fall, that's typical, and she twirls on her left knee. Now that, she's on a bone on bone situation, she's severely arthritic and waiting for her knee replacement. And I said, oh, don't do that for God's sake. She goes, I feel great. So the gates continue to open. We start to look for different items. We look for different ideas. And what I just described to you was a topical product. Normally, you and I have always seen Cheech and Chong. <laughs> they find the biggest person with the biggest amount of cannabis in the biggest crazy ass, sorry, uh, thing that they can, they can create to smoke and the biggest hair. It's, it, you know, I just got judged the other day, by the way, that I'm not in the culture. I don't have the look. What is the look? I think this is the look. But long story short, you know, we, we are looking for different things. And, and this isn't about Cheech and Chong any longer. We have different alternatives. Yes, you can smoke. Yes, you can vaporize. But there are tinctures, drops that you put under your tongue. I don't think that's all about getting people high. This is medicine. We have edible products. Things, and anything edible is what you can swallow. So it could be a capsule. It could be part of something that's chewy. But that's called an edible. The topical I already spoke about, it's the creams, it's the rubs, it's the bombs, goes on your skin. And then we also have transdermal patches, nice slow release for someone who has glaucoma. Um, and the other thing that uh, Mike alluded to is the suppository method, and you can use rectal or vaginal. So you have the endometriosis client, or patient, or worker, they lose a lot of time at work. You have someone who's dealing with severe arthritis. You have someone who has insomnia. Think about all of the workers that you have in your environment, and they're coming to work heavily drugged. But it's okay because it's legal. It's okay because opiates are all right. It's okay because we can watch my mother drive to play cards on Dilaudid. No, it's not okay. We're just gonna just a pictorial look here. Tinctures. Cuthbert's cream is just basically a cream that you would buy in a little tub. There's a little picture, some edibles. Obviously, you saw the cannabis on the video. And then there's a transdermal patch, which you probably have already seen. But I think that we really just have got to get to a place where we're starting to open our mind to alternatives. In my very limited time that I have um, been involved with cannabis, we've managed to save a job. We've managed to take somebody that could not walk, walk again and get out of their home. Um, we have still working on some migraine issues without a doubt, but I also had an, a huge opportunity to go work with Stu Martin in Regina. And that guy has done so many incredible things for so many people. And it's not using necessarily Chi and Chong. We are moving into a world of medicine that you take orally. And it's not about your head. It's not about trying to get your head high. It's totally trying to avoid it. But to control your pain, your, your chronic illness, your disease process, and in some cases, even watching a tumor shrink. I'm helping a family right now, and it's their elder mom, afraid to go to the doctor, ends up with a huge, massive tumor. The tumor has now shrunk. They cannot see it protruding anymore. They cannot palpate it. And the cool thing about this is we jumped in on this with the family, before they started chemotherapy, before they started radiation. So, let's open our minds. Let's think a little bit different. And it's not about getting high. It's not a teach and chong. It's about you and me and just trying to find solutions that aren't so harsh on our bodies. So, I think with that, I'm just gonna get off of here. And I do have a little 
antidote here eventually, but we'll see what Deb, if she asks me a question or not. But um, I'll just pass this back to Mike. So anyway, I was one of you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Wendy. I, I, getting to work with, with cannabis and being more open about it. Um, you know, more about me professionally, I went back to university when I was a little older and got my degree in history and French. And somebody said to me, well, what can you do with that? And I said, well, you can make a really good bus driver. And I went and started working in transit. And I was actually uh, working as a manager over uh, at STC there when they, when they closed us down. So um, I'd been always involved with cannabis and I knew about the good work that uh, Pat and Best Buds was doing and it just seemed like I had to get into this and in, a, in, a, in, a, in an overt way, in a way that where we can go out and talk to people about what we're doing. And uh, I've never felt more part of the community and I've never seen more wonderful people. Uh, one, of, I'm, uh, one of our patients uh, that, that's getting some medicine there is, uh, is from a local Hutterite colony. And I always said in my life I wanted to be in a situation where I was getting like homemade bread and buns and stuff to take home. And I'm telling you, my wife and kids are just loving it. So I, I, I thought it would be, I thought it might be, uh, uh, we'll just carry on here now too. I know I'm, um, I'm quite verbose and taking a lot of time. But um, uh, I, I, it's, it would be interesting for us to look a little bit about what's going on in the United States. Um, I think specifically everybody knows that recreational cannabis has been legalized now for a few years in, in Colorado. Uh, this is some, 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 some recent statistics you have on here. 59.3% uh, of the United States population lives in a state where um, uh, cannabis of some tor form has been legalized. Uh, 29 states plus Washington, D.C. have uh, laws in regard to medical cannabis. 19 plus Washington, D.C. have operating dispensaries. Eight states plus Washington, D.C. have recreational marijuana laws. And uh, four are operating with uh, retail stores. Cali uh, I think that's California, Nevada, uh, Oregon, and um, uh, Washington State. Now, everybody has heard about the opioid crisis, and we're not going to go uh, over the top on it today, but um, they there is correlations, and they do find um, that in places where there are states that have uh, medical cannabis laws, that uh, they see things like opioid average opioid deaths uh, uh, decline. Um, you know, they see also. I think that this is a little instructive, just as far as like the sort of like tax revenue that you're seeing now. In in, in Colorado State, they have a developed system for retailing cannabis. They don't have that in Washington uh, yet. But in, 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 um, in Colorado State, uh, you can see that even like the recreational uh, cannabis tax uh, revenue uh, is, is, uh, is uh, beating their alcohol tax revenue. And, and there's quite a bit of, uh, of the medical tax revenue. And I know I promised not to speak much about this recreational stuff, but I think it does show that once th things do go recreational, that the whole world isn't going to blow apart. Things are going to stay this. Things are going to stay the same and, and possibly get better. Uh, you know, a year after uh, uh, cannabis became legalized, there, um, you know, uh, fastest growing state economy. You know, forty million dollars of taxable re revenue, eighty-five or eighty-four percent decrease in in arrests, decrease in property crime, decrease in traffic fatalities. Um, so, so there are positive effects. Now, uh, uh, there are. It's not all positive, and I don't mean to come off as overly positive, but when we're fighting prohibition and stuff as long as we have, these are the sort of things that, that we have to face. So, so the gateway drug argument comes up quite a bit. You know, you guys are going to start using cannabis, and we're just going to send these people spiraling down into a pit. Um, there's been a lot of science showing that this gateway theory is not correct. It was popular in the 70s and the 80s, but now they're showing there's a lot of different ways and that perhaps an individual's opportunities and unique propensities determine their risk to use hard drugs. Um, you know, alcohol is prevalent in our society. I would say that it's easy to argue that, that um, alcohol could be considered a gateway drug. Um, Dealing with people in the legal and uh, in, in medical uh, cannabis world, um, as I mentioned earlier, when people don't have options about what they can get, they're forced to the black market. And when you're forced into a place where there's illegal contraband, 
then you might get an opportunity to get illegal contraband. So, so there I could see, you know, uh, um, you know, a, a good argument for having dispensaries, and also an argument, a valid argument for, you know, having sort of this cross of of, of drug use. Um, Medical cannabis education and the availability of affordable medicine is an important way to keep medical cannabis patients away from the black market. This is a, a statistic, and I know uh, you know uh, Joe Rogan, uh, the guy that used to be on Fear Factor. Does anybody watch his podcast or anything? He's he's he's, he's yeah he's a, he's a pretty popular guy. He talks about this stuff all the way, and he says the only way you're ever going to die from cannabis is if somebody drops it out of a plane and it lands on you. When I talk to my own doctor about it, and I talk about um, my prescription and, and getting that done, the way that the way that it works right now is when a doctor in Canada prescribes cannabis, they descri they prescribe it in an amount per day that you can use in in grams of dry flour that's how that's how they determine it so if they, they'll say to you you can have a prescription where you have three grams a day or ten grams a day of dry flour and then you're allowed to have twice as much of that on you um, l legally yes okay so 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 my doctor said to me I was talking to this he says Mike I know there's no amount that I can give you that is going to harm you but when we're prescribing cannabis, the, 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 the Board of Physicians and, and Surgeons, the College of Physicians and Surgeons is watching them because they're looking at um, um, the way that doctors are prescribing cannabis, just like they're prescribing any other drug. Again, everybody knows somebody affected by the opioid crisis. And like I previously mentioned, no special license is required for patients to have these things. So what are the current issues that are facing us? Financial pressure, current medical cannabis pricing, and a lack of coverage makes cannabis a very prohibit cost prohibitive medicine. Uh, average LP price per gram is ten dollar, ten to fifteen dollars uh, uh, plus shipping. So for a patient patient using dry cannabis, uh, five gram a day prescription, that's going to cost a person around fifteen hundred dollars a month. Tinctures uh, and oils cost more. Actually, it was Deb was referring to. It's my partner's son who is who is using uh, medical cannabis. He can't use dry flour. He's uh, got severe autism with a seizure disorder, and he has to use oils. And when they extract the cannabis from the oils, it takes a lot more to make them. So, so his his the cost of his prescription would probably be nearly three thousand dollars a month. Now, this is an important point here. I think that everybody's uh, probably worried worried about driving an equipment operation, especially for HR people in the company. I mean, I used to be a manager. Of bus drivers. I didn't want my bus drivers to be intoxicated on cannabis or oxycontin when they were driving a, a bus. Um, so how does this work? You know, well, I think you know this argument comes up quite a bit when it comes to recreational use. It should be just like alcohol. You you use cannabis, no driving. When it comes to medical use, though, it's more complicated than that. We have patients that use cannabis for ADHD. Uh, so they're not using the they're not using the stimulant Ritalin. They're using uh, cannabis instead. And when they use cannabis, it calms down their ADHD symptoms and they're able to drive. Now, that's a, that's a, a specific example and one that I think that if, if you were you're in, in a complicated legal environment, perhaps you could have special dispensation for those individual uh, 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 you know, things. Uh, but a, 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 at the end of the day, this individual, if he did not have cannabis, he could not drive. Now, he also works on the oil field. He's a manager there. They know about his cannabis use. They know how much he can have in his system. So when he's working, he actually has to use Ritalin. And then when he's away from work, he can use cannabis. You know, and, 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 and the cannabis works better for him. But because of that. So, so prohibition area stereotypes and stigmas still exist. And patients who even know that this will help them will not use it because of the misinformation and propaganda. We've all heard of reefer madness, you know, th this sort of thing. And, and I think it's obvious when you see these, these, these pictures that, you know, there, there is a certain amount of, 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 of culture uh, that we were living at the time of this prohibition that doesn't exist today. And, and it, obviously we need to, uh, to do this. So uh, before we wrap up, who's covered right now? Veterans are covered. So if you're a veteran, Veterans Affairs will cover three grams of cannabis per day. They'll cover up to 10 grams of cannabis with a special di dispensation from a specialist or their doctor. Um, last year, this, uh, this made a or earlier this year, this made quite a bit of uh, noise. Although it's not much, Law of Laws is covering medical cannabis up to a maximum of $1,500 per year. For very specific treatments, it says uh, uh, spasticity, uh, neuropathic pain associated with MS and nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy for ca cancer patients. But it's a start. It's a start. And I think that's what is important is that, 
you know, we can't expect the floodgates to open and everything to change overnight. We talk about cannabis. I'm sure a lot of you in the room have heard about CBD. A lot of you have heard about all of these marvelous things that are happening. And we need to have skepticism. It's, it isn't, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's a very important uh, part of medicine, but it's not a wonder drug. And, and so, so we, need to have, we need to have some skepticism, but these things like this are a start. Like I just bought, brought up CBD. Very, very popular in the dispensary. People are coming in all the time. What's this cannabis that I can get that doesn't make me feel high that helps me? And this is, this is, this is CBD that they're talking about. And one of the things that we're educating people about is that even though CBD is important and it's helping people, it helps people better when it is worked together in concert with THC. So, so, so there's almost a little bit of uh, misinformation, but CBD is helpful because um, people are finding that it's helping with anti-inflammation, it's ha helping with anxiety, it's helping, um, uh, I have a slide on here, uh, that's when Nate Diaz is vaporizing CBD uh, on uh, national television in August 2016, created quite a uh, stir. However, just last week, or what was it, on the 10th of October, we found out pro athletes rejoice. CBD no longer banned by the World Anti-Doping Association. So these changes are happening. Where do we go from here? What can we do uh, about medical cannabis. I think we need to find patients affordable options to obtain medical cannabis. And I think today, from some of the other parts of the presentations that we heard, those options do exist and they're gonna become reality. So I think that's very exciting for patients. And I think for patients that are using cannabis, hopefully as administrators and people that are, are paying for these benefits, that there's gonna be cost savings associated with it because maybe people that are using cannabis can get some help and it won't be quite as expensive. We need responsible regulation and oversight. How will Canada be able to protect the medical supply of cannabis once recreational pur purchases are made? And this is again where the dispensaries come in. So once everybody in Canada is allowed to buy cannabis and it's only available from the 40 licensed producers who are here right now, is there gonna be enough cannabis for everybody? Now, this is an important question to us because I think unlike alcohol prohibition, there wasn't a bunch of people using alcohol illegally because they were really sick. Well, I mean, they might have been sick because they were alcoholics, perhaps. But, but I don't think it was really the same thing. This is a true concern for us. Once the floodgates open and there's a limited supply, where's the supply going to come from? We know in our industry that there is not enough of a supply. And the only way to make sure that there's enough supply is for what you might, what we might have referred to in the past as black market growers. Now, for those of you that are involved or know anything about the cannabis world, Canada has a reputation of having the best. Okay, we're we're like we're like we're we're right up there with every the best places in the world for cannabis. So there's people in Saskatchewan right now who are not criminals that grow cannabis. What can we do? to regulate them? What can we do to get their product tested and get their stuff entered in the supply chain so that medical cannabis patients do have a supply? This is something that we're definitely concerned about. You know, there's a lot of science that's been done, but not a lot of science that's been shown. Of course, everybody knows cannabis is still on the schedule one of United States drugs, so uh, according to the United States, there's no human benefit to it. Until that gets changed and they can start doing some science there too, that's another challenge that we're gonna have. So. Um, I think going from there, is there any questions? Okay, we're well, going to hold the questions here. Because I'm going to introduce our second guy. And then we're going to have questions because I have some questions, that's for sure. Oh, I'm just, Randy, come on up. We've been holding him off. He's like, oh my gosh, I want to speak to everybody. Um, okay, Randy is a good friend and a colleague, and we work with him quite closely uh, with respect to legal aspects of our business. Uh, he's with um, the W Group and has been uh, there for quite some years. He's senior partner in the organization, and they have a fairly large office, 16 lawyers, that have specialization in, in certain areas. Um, one of the uh, areas that, that Randy works and specializes in is general practice with respect to estates and large corporate. Uh, sorry, you do general practice with a present focus on estates and large corporate business and real estate practice. So um, quite, um, quite specialized in that area, but was very, very open to coming and speaking to us a little bit about the idea of bringing legalization of, of marijuana into the workplace and the medical marijuana and how we're going to have to coach our clients. And so um, in terms of uh, his uh, talk, I just want to add one more thing, community. He's uh, very involved in hockey. So you got both knees still? <laughs> 
Oh, you just coach it. Oh, yeah. okay. Because he says hockey, hockey I, soccer, and baseball involvement. Boys. He just watches it. That's what he's saying. He just watches it. All right. So you're going to add a few points in with respect to just what you as HR need to be thinking about, and then we'll throw some questions at you after. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be the last person speaking after uh, everybody else. It was a lot more exciting, so they bring the guy with the suit and the white hair now. It's really special. Uh, two, two things. One, Deb's presentation may be longer than mine, introducing me. And uh, two, I don't have a PowerPoint, so we'll get through this fairly quick. But there are a few things that come up that are important. And I think as employers, and that's what I'm looking at basically from the perspective of employers, with the advent of medical cannabis. And I'll start using that phrase now that you say it's better to do it. Firstly, from an employer's perspective, it's not a crisis. Just because this is it, it's not a huge change to what you do in HR or how you deal with your corporations or your employees. The law in affecting employers is essentially the same before, after, and, and will continue to be the, the way it is. What I think is, as employers, you have to be aware of the new situation, as, as set out uh, very uh, well today by Mike. Uh, be aware of it and look how you should be handling it in your particular situation. And when I think of employers, it's always important to remember the basics, common sense. That covers just about everything. So think about it. How should I view this situation? Reasonableness. If you think it would be unreasonable if people did this to you, think how that is you dealing with your employees or your staff. And respect. I think respect is very important for your employees, for, your, for the employers, so it's from employees to employers, and for the whole staff and, and employees and the people you're working with. And remember, it's not significantly different. Drug impairment, medication, alcohol, the, all of these things can be uh, an impact on the workplace. So that doesn't change. That's how you're viewing things. Uh, you cannot be impaired at work. I mean, that doesn't change. You still can't be stoned. You can't be drunk. You can't be out of it for whatever reason it is. So one of the most important things as an employer is have a drug policy. Now that isn't going to be just a drug policy, it's a complete HR policy on how to deal with impairment, with medication, with alcoholism, with a number of things. And from my perspective, there's, there's a couple of things that are really important in that. Firstly, have it in writing. Just don't say this is what our, our policy has always been. Our policy should be in writing. It should be confirmed by your employees. So it isn't just you impose it on them and, and send them an email. Make sure every employee has signed that, comes back and acknowledges what the policy is, and they need to know what it is. Review it annually. Just as this whole thing of medical cannabis has come into the situation, it's a new thing to, to approach as an employer. So be ready for that. Who knows what's going to come up next year or how the law is going to change regarding this next year. So look at it. Don't just file it away in your drawer. Look at it annually and remind your employees about it on an annual basis. I think that's absolutely essential. So some of the things, and I've got a list of some things to, to look at, is establishing an alcohol and drug policy and procedures. Define safety sensitive positions. As again, Mike, you were very helpful for, for doing my, my speech for me earlier. Um, there's some situations that are sensitive. Being a bus driver is pretty important. Working heavy duty uh, uh, as a uh, driver or mechanic, those things, there's dangerous situations. You have to watch for that where safety is especially sensitive. So look at it and educate yourself about the situation as much as you can. And part of that education is you can do the education yourself. You may need, and of course I'd love this, hire your lawyer to review this stuff for you. I think that's, you know, it, it sounds a bit crass and it's not just self-serving. It's important because lawyers look at things in a way that you may not in, in how it will impact. And HR is tricky enough without trying to guess what you're doing. So do that. Uh, duty to disclose. It's one of the duties that uh, is, is a bit of a, a question. I'm going to refer to a case called the IBEW case. It's 2016. And in this case, the court, uh, in this case, judicially reviewed an arbitrator's decision upholding termination 
of an employee for their use of medically prescribed cannabis outside the workplace, non-disclosure of the same and possession of legal medical uh, cannabis in the workplace. They had policies in place. And they said, the court said that uh, this non-disclosure and possession was a breach of the policy. And a reasonable finding of misconduct could be found. However, they found termination was not necessarily reasonable in this case. Okay? The arbitrator's finding of misconduct required a further analysis of whether a lesser penalty short of termination was appropriate in those circumstances. So it's important to look at all the circumstances. Just because someone has done, made a mistake, maybe they're a long-term employee, was it dangerous to other people? There's a lot of factors in dealing with that, and, and I hesitate to use the talk to your lawyer situation again, but again, you have to be very careful. Termination has a lot of ramifications from an employer's perspective, because if you're deemed to terminate them wrongfully, you can pay a lot of damages as well. And, it isn't just the fact of the monetary payment. That's a whole lot of hassle. And it affects the rest of your employees. It affects your HR staff because they're stressed out on it. And it can affect the ultimate workplace. So be, be careful of what you're doing. In the Saskatchewan Employment Act, employers here should be aware that sections 3 to 10 require workers to take reasonable care to protect his or her health and safety and the health and safety of workers who may, may be affected by their acts and omissions. So there again, there's a positive obligation, even if you don't have a formal policy, to make sure you're properly able to function in, in the workplace. Um, there's also a duty on you as employers to protect their workers. So if you're conscious of an employee who is not acting properly and you suspect that they may be impaired, you have a positive obligation to make sure they don't impact on themselves or the other em employees in the situation. So it isn't just making sure you've got proper safety nets and everything else. This is a positive obligation on you to be aware of the situation. So this can be the basis for a, pol a policy to require disclosure, and I think that's important. If you have a situation where there's an employee on medical cannabis and it affects some, in some ways what they're doing. It's a little bit more awkward on how you have to deal with it, but you have a duty to accommodate. And that means you have to make reasonable accommodations for your employees if they have problems. And that's no different than if I go blind in my eye or I've got some other medical condition that requires things. You have to try to accommodate that, and the phrase, the legal phrase is to the point of undue hardship. So. It's a case-by-case -case situation. You have to look to see what is reasonable in this case. You've got a heavy-duty uh, operator. Maybe you've got to make sure, is there another position within the firm that he can be doing or she can be doing at that moment in time while they're in this condition? That is not a dangerous situation. Okay. Some examples, you can adjust the workstation. You can modify the work schedule if that affects their medication or transfer to a different department depending upon the size of your operation. What it does not mean is you have to allow an employee to carry on their duties while impaired. You just, that is just not there. It doesn't matter, as I said earlier, whether you're drunk or you're stoned or whatever the situation may be. No, that isn't right. It's not limitless. So you don't have to create a brand new position for them. That might, creates an undue hardship for you. But you have to look at the situation and you have to be very careful what you're doing. Uh, you can ask to see their medical uh, cannabis license. And I think that's a fair situation. That can be the policy that if you're on medication, you need to provide that, that license to the employer so they know what's going on. Uh, substance dependency may require the same duty of accommodation as any other. So it's just there. So, be very cautious. Duty to investigate. Where use is contrary to be policy, be, be careful. There's a, there's a number of issues in the duty to investigate. If you're aware of a problem, just as there's any problem going on, yeah, you've got to make a positive in investigation to see if there's something going on with your employee. That's part of being a good employer as well. So look at that. 
But impairment is a difficult thing. Marijuana or cannabis is just different from alcohol. Testing is different. The fact of it being in your system doesn't mean you're stoned. I'm certainly no expert on, on cannabis, but there's a lingering effect that's in your system for a longer period of time. It does not necessarily, by any means, mean you're impaired. But it could mean you're impaired. It's hard to know, so you have to be very careful. <clears throat> and that can go to the policies that, that you determine. And I'm not aware of all the policies, but I know it's at some of the uh, big mines and whatnot, they're very careful of making sure the drug policy is, is set. You may have to have your analysis or other things from time to time. It depends upon your workplace. If you've got an office staff, that probably isn't quite the same concern. Still, they can't be stoned when they come to work. They've got to answer the phone or do what they've got to do, but, but be careful. Look to see if there's a safety-sensitive workplace, and that can be part of the policy. There's no explicit direction or definition of, of what that is, but look in your work what there is, and look how that changes from time to time. You may be doing certain things, and all of a sudden you've got someone on a scaffold that you don't normally have, or there's different things look at it very carefully. Where there's alertness of machinery and surrounding, it's funny, in my notes I'm looking at that and thinking to the, again, the comment Mike made earlier, uh, there may be some other accommodation. And maybe there's other medication or other things they can be taking that aren't going to create a problem in the workplace. And you have the right to ask those questions of your employee to see what's, what's reasonable. So do that. Um, but you need cause to justify the, the test, and you can't just say, we want to test. So you've got to be very careful, again, in looking at that. Build things into your policy that are reasonable. You build unreasonable things in your policy, you've got other issues. And you've got employees that are unhappy or a staff that is, is balking you at the whole time. That's not what any, any of us as employers want. Certainly, remove an employee from a dangerous situation. You don't play around with that. If you're if you're not 100% sure, but you're pretty sure, take them out of that situation. You can deal with it, you can, in another, another case. But what you don't do is arbitrarily fire them immediately unless you've got absolutely clear cause for doing that. And that's not black and white. Um, question, confirm, keep within the employee policies. Uh, maybe part of the policies You've got to give them reasonable notice of, of testing or those types of things. Maybe they have the right to have an advocate or if it's a unionized situation, the shop steward to be there with them. It's a pretty daunting thing to be hauled into the office and questioned. And maybe that's a good idea to allow them to have someone with them. But have all those things in writing. So it's a fairly short presentation. I tried to speak fast because your mic didn't. And, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say anything else. <laughs> but it is important to think about these things from a fresh approach, realizing it really isn't a change. It's just whenever new technology comes in, whenever a new situation comes in, this is no different than, than uh, the law as it has been for quite some period of time. So I'll leave it at that, and, and we can deal with questions as they come up. Thank you. OK. I said 11.15, 11.30. That gives us seven minutes for some questions. Are we going to be good with that? There might be some questions here, because I'd like to ask a couple questions. So when do you come on up to? So now we have nothing else to complete the day. I think the questionnaires, the surveys are done. Um, there will be four gifts to give away. So maybe what I can ask is the staff just bring me up four names, and we can rattle those off at the end as well. And, uh, and I'm going to start with the fir first question. Uh, Wendy. I referred to, okay, oh, you guys need a mic, by the way. Oh, sure, there's some mics. Yeah. You can sit. Okay. I can stand, because now I'll be the same height. Okay, so. <laughs> um, okay, Mike referred to in the, uh, in the presentation the cost, which could be prohibitive, especially if you don't have anything to back it up. So, uh, Wendy, you're seeing the people. Um, what is that conversation sounding and looking like? Um, I would like to say that the cost is becoming a factor. Uh, the opiates, the uh, traditional pharma is covered, and we're seeing people that go, I don't want to be on that anymore. I don't want to do it, but that stuff's covered. But this cannabis is not. The cannabis is helping me to get off of my dilaudid. Now, let's, I'm going to be very honest with you. What this is forcing people to do is they're going out into the street. 
and they're selling their dilaudid, they're selling their morphine in order to get money to buy cannabis. How backwards is this? And, and that's the reality. That's what you guys have to understand. Like, because there's no benefit, because there's no ability to have it partially compensated for, it forces them to continue with the opiate process. Um, I just want to give you a little quick, quick, quick cost thing here. Okay, so Sunday, two Sundays ago, I got up. Basically, I'm going to give you a Reader's Digest version. Got up, hurt my back, SI joints affected. I can't move. I am like walking like I'm 92. I can do nothing. I can't drive. I get my husband to go to the drugstore. He comes back with about $94 bill with Robaxa set this, that, whatever else I needed. Because I send him a list. I then subsequently went to a chiropractor. I had acupuncture. That was another $120. This was my daughter-in-law too, by the way. Um, but the end result was I ended up going back and I, I got two 10 milligram capsules that had cannabis oil in it and they were $1.50 each. I went home and I went, okay, just do it because you're the one preaching. The rectal method is the best thing to do. Whoop, up they went. <laughs> Proud to say. We're getting a visual of that, Wendy. I don't know. That's good. I know. <laughs> but what that offered me was within five minutes, I had total relief. <laughs> and so, again, am I becoming more and more and more believer? Yes, I absolutely am. I'm watching the incredible results for insomnia. I'm watching this. And then, you know, and then I come up with this rectal thing that I got from Stu Martin, and, and he's very knowledgeable about pain control. So... Basically, I could have spent three bucks. How much money did I spend? Two, two fifty. Anyway, that's my that's my deal. Okay, so I shared something that I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> TMI. It's <laughs> all good. <laughs> all right, audience question. Don't tell me you're that. Oh, Pat's got a question. Yes. You need a mic. Can you repeat the question, Randy? Uh, I should have the mic there. I think, <laughs> I don't know if I can talk that quickly. Um, the question is, can you ask employees in the hiring process about their, whether they have medical condition requiring this? And uh, I'm just trying to rack my pea brain about this, thinking about the human rights legislation of the things you can't ask. And you have to be very careful not to go contrary to that in your questioning, and I think it would be very, I think it's unlikely that you can actually ask that ahead of time. I, I would like to speak with that as well, as being part of human resources for a, a huge health region here. Well, now we're probably almost one health region. We were not, the actual hiring manager was not allowed to ask about medications. But what I would encounter is the employee that I would find a fentanyl patch on them, and then I would ask them about it. And then sometimes I could intercede and we could uh, inadvertently um, I would talk to the individual about the fact, okay, if you have a severe neck injury, how on earth are you going to be a, a receptionist? How are you going to hold your arms up to type? What are you going to be able to do? And just by those questions as that person's nurse, they were able to kind of go, you know what, this is, you know, and I said, like, I don't want to see you become more injured than you already are and they opted out of the job. But how many times do we have that opportunity? How many of you folks have nurses in, in your employee pool? 
You probably don't. So it's a very, very good question, uh, but I don't believe that the employer has the right to ask. But, but I think you could still a ask, if this is a particular position, are you capable of doing that? That may be a different way of approaching the, the question, because you still have to have the qualifications for the particular job. You just can't um, say, are you bipolar? Are you whatever? in that situation, I don't believe you can go that, that far, but you still have to have the mechanics to be able to do the job, whatever it happens to be. Your, your question, is there a duty to disclose? I don't believe there's a duty to disclose unless that is within the policies that are, are set up that they've already agreed upon. So if that is in your policy manual and they've agreed to do that, and I think that's uh, probably okay to build that into your policy manual, fine. But not just uh, not in the hiring process. Just as an add-on to my um, story from the Sunday fix, <laughs> so to speak, I had zero impact on my on my psychoactive. Like I moved around fine. I was fine. There was no effect on my head whatsoever. And it's because of the method that was utilized. If I was to have swallowed those capsules, I would have had something going on with my head. Um, now I want to put this to you. I was a nurse for 33 years. There's many back injuries in the workforce in healthcare. Many are using opiates. They're like, like this. Now, would you rather have had me looking after you with my whoop, method, with zero head effect, being clear-minded, sound? Would you rather have had me looking after you or your loved one or the nurse or the CCA or whoever out to lunch on an opiate? I, I so honestly just think repeat, that just it's got to be, question, okay, so quickly. the question, or the statement was, or the comment was, so yeah, I would, how, how could you figure out as an employer, what is the method that this person could be using medical cannabis, like they want to know specifically about the method, because yeah, I, she said, I would rather have you look after me than someone who's, I'm going to use the word, stoned on an opiate inability to make decisions. The decision-making process is impaired. You know, we are looking after loved ones in healthcare. So, Rand, yeah, do we but, have a right? But I don't think you've got the right to ask that question. I think the issue is, is the employee capable of doing the job while they're taking the, the medical marijuana? And you can ask that question and, if need be, get uh, further advice uh, on it or from the doctor. Or, or, and you can go behind it a little bit that way. But uh, you can't say, how are you, how are you taking your drugs? So it's going to be, first you have to see an indication that someone isn't completing their job in a safe way or it's not being treated properly. And then you have to ask. Yeah, there has to be a problem with their duty to perform. There has to be some sort of a written up statements. I mean, you usually get one, two, three times and then there's... There's, there's a quite the process uh, when, you, of course, you all know this, but, but long story short, having told you my story, I would still be deemed as I would test positive for cannabis right now. I'm not stoned, you guys. I never was. But I would test positive today, and I do not believe, I could tap dance, I could do whatever for you, but I, I, I would test positive. I would fail a drug test that I would be looking after you and everything would be good, but I would fail. So what would you do with me? I'm just gonna introduce uh, Kimberly Semlak, uh, junior, uh, well, my articling student at our firm. She's got an answer to or comment on this as well. Yeah, so I did a lot of research for Randy's presentation. Um, so I just thought. <laughs> Aw, that's so sweet. <laughs> I thought I'd add to that. Randy, so you, you sound like Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you said that you had a very safety sensitive workplace. So as Randy mentioned earlier that the Saskatchewan Employment Act says employers are responsible for having a safe workplace and employees are responsible for that as well. So in your policy you have you should have something saying that if you are on any medications that could affect your ability to work in this safety sensitive environment, you should be disclosing that. So although there's not a legal duty to disclose in your policy where you have a safety sensitive workplace, I think that would be a reasonable uh, duty that you could put in your policy. Yeah, and I think that goes to the point, Pat, correct me, because I think way back, we had, um, we had a situation where they didn't disclose that they had epileptic seizures, that they were taking medicine. So for us, we don't know. And I mean, obviously that could have been quite drastic because if there was a situation, we don't know. And so, but yet it's interesting because the feedback was, well, you don't need to know. It's not your business to know. Where, so it gets a bit dicey when you're starting to deal with policies and what you can and can't ask. So one last question, we're gonna wrap up. Oh, Cliff got one. I'm very confident that you as, uh, I, I think, smaller employers would have the relationship with your workers that you would have those conversations without hypocrisy. Whether, you're, whether you are a crew of 20 or 250, when you get into the 1900 region and, and higher, it gets very, very difficult as a human resource department to monitor this and to have those relationships. But I, I'm hoping so we have a bit of an advantage is what you're saying. I, I think That's you a good do. thing. I think you so, truly do. Yeah. Last question, Mike. We're wrapping up. I know that there's maybe more questions. We could continue, but don't hesitate if you have to sneak out. But um, what's an and what's kind of an average client that comes into the dispensary? You know that's uh, that's that's a really uh, interesting question. Um, I, I was uh, working and doing some stuff with with Best Buds outside of the dispensary level. And when I first got into the dispensary, I'm talking to a young girl who's there, and she's looking for um, a sort of vapor, product to vaporize to help her with her her, her um, um, appetite. And, and you'd think you're talking to Britney Spears across the counter, and then she, you know, she informs you she's got stage four colon cancer you know so so you you're, you've got people that just like look like everybody else and they're 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 facing these incredible challenges and they're just looking for something and they're not looking for something to replace their conventional medicine they're just looking for something that might help they're seeing these videos on the internet that are coming around they're they're hearing um, the stories that, that that people are that people are sharing about this, um, but one of my favorite one uh, p patients right now, like like w we have um, a patient who's from a like a like a like a like a Hutterite colony, and um, you know these are very religious people who never considered cannabis, and uh, there's actually it's actually spreading where there's uh, an issue. There was sort of a I wouldn't I don't want to say like a hereditary illness, but somebody had a, a similar form of cancer on their brain from like that was a relative at another colony, and they one person got help with us, and then the consultant started communicating with them and started getting help with them, and it sort started dominoing around. So seeing those 
things happening all the time and in such a positive way. It's, I invite any of you that are in Saskatoon to come by the dispensary because, uh, you know, Wendy was talking about all of the, the Cheech and Chong sort of chronic, you know, that marijuana leaf, cannabis leaf stereotype. It, it, it goes against everything. Everything that's actually happening in medical cannabis goes against all of your stereotypes. So uh, when, you, when you actually start to see, so, so who is the average patient? It's, it's Wendy, it's me, it's you, it's everyone. Yeah. Uh, yes, because they're the ones that have hit the wall. They probably are on about 20 sets of medication and probably three times over on that 20 sets of medication and still haven't found answers. So, so bottom line is there's a lot of conversation to continue on this. I would love to spend more time talking about it. But what we could do, if you guys are game, all three of you, because Randy does, you need, to, you, need be, you need to be cognizant of the legal applications of this. And, it, and to your point, it's not new. It's just revisions and making sure it's, it's in your, well, if you have a policy handbook, that'd be the first thing, right? But, uh, but that's just part of the process of reviewing it and reviewing it regularly. Um, to, to Wendy, the chatter. See, this is the gal that didn't want to even come up, actually, at first. Well, I don't know. Well, I might have a couple minutes to... And now she just, like, wants to take over that stage. It's like, good. And then to, to Mike, it's... <laughs> and then to Mike, I mean, the knowledge that he has and the depth of, of knowledge in all different areas, I think, it brings light to the fact that you're normal, and this is just going to be normal conversation. We need to wrap our heads around it. So the key now, the challenge is, is, is integrating it into the benefit world, the conversations, the education, the awareness we need to bring about, and obviously the product line that's going to be able to bring the opportunity to cover some of the costs. That will be the challenging point. So there's probably a lot of mindsets together trying to figure out how that's going to